All right, we're going to start this. It's always game day in Buffalo with me. Going back to the last episode when Matt Bove and I were at Barbell, we are now back in Casa Bove and Studio Capote. Okay. All right, good to see yeah. you. Mark. Um, and we talked about like Olympic sports, and I tried to attempt to play the spoons when we were at Barbell. And I said, yes. Oh. I actually thought of a sport that you said you were great at folding laundry, right? That was your thing. Like You could do that. You are elite. Yeah. I th- something that was, I said, you know what? This is what I should have said. Parallel parking. Oh, I'm elite parallel parker, Matt Bove. Well, that's a good skill to have because it's something you're always going to need. I will say this. So I have a car that has a camera in the back mm-hmm. of it and my work car has a camera in the back of it. Well, the other day I had to take a different car to work because my car was being serviced and I did not have a backup camera mm-hmm. and backing in, which is now what I'm used to doing all of a sudden became a little bit more of a challenging task because we're so spoiled with those backup cameras, those rear view cameras. So that's a good thing to have. And and listen, I'm a very good parallel parker without it. I'm an elite parallel parker with the backup camera. I think that's one of the best inventions ever for a vehicle to be quite honest. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like it should have been something that took that long to figure out. Like (laughs) I had, so I got a car probably like two years ago. I bought a car but my car prior to that was a 2010 and I didn't have it for years. And everybody was like, how can you not have a rear view camera? And I'm like, I don't know. I just got used to not having it. But now that I do have it, I don't think I could ever go back to not having it. Oh, that's right. I live on a street in the city that has alternate parking, alternating parking, left-hand side on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, right-hand side on Thursday, Friday. I do not have a driveway. I do not have a garage. So I have to, you don't have a driveway. No, I don't have a driveway. No, most, uh, most, um, Houses on my street do not have a driveway. Wow. We're, we're packed in, in the city and you park on the left and you park on the right. And if you're not in the correct side on those days, you get a ticket. So it happens. I, so you have to always parallel park. It's always tight. I actually have gone outside and gotten into other people's car to parallel park for them. No kidding. Yes. Really? Just like shoveling out for them. So it's just you go out and you shovel out. The same they, just, they trust you. They, they trust you're not taking <laughs> their car to joyride somewhere else. <laughs> So that's my, uh, that's after we had left bar bill, by the way, Matt, I know you share my sentiment just to thank everybody for yeah. uh, the night we had a bar bill. Yeah, for sure. It was awesome. It was, I'm always admittedly like a little nervous before those. Cause I don't mm-hmm. know if there's going to be people who show up and it's like, is there going to yeah. be support? Is everything going to go well? And we really appreciated those of you who came out. We met somebody who came in from not specifically just for the podcast, but they went to Bill's training camp, but we met somebody from Minnesota. We met someone from Alaska. We met someone yeah. from Texas. We met a couple of people from Florida. You knew someone there from Germany who is a Ford exchange student who oh is gosh. there. So yes. maybe it's always game day in Buffalo is internationally known, but <laughs> thank you to everybody who came. Thank you to everybody who came and said hi to us. Thanks to Barbill for having us. And uh, it's definitely something I think we want to do again in the future. For sure. Hey, if you're interested in having us, if you're in like a business and a bar, a restaurant, especially someplace where there's a gathering and people can have some fun, you know, inquire if you want, and we'll put you into the right direction to people and we'll come out and we'll, we'll do a show for you there. So we'll make sure that you um, can uh, have a great experience with us. And we'd love to be sharing it with you. In the meantime, we got back to St. John Fisher. That was Monday. There was practice on Tuesday the team. Now the bills have gone through a full week plus of training camp. Then they get to Highmark Stadium on Friday night for the annual return of the blue and red. Uh, it was a little bit of inclement weather early on. It rained a little mm-hmm. bit later, but did not dampen 36,000 plus who showed up a new record for the return of the blue and red. And of course, a big storyline. What helmet would Josh Allen wear? Came out of the tunnel and a black helmet with a red standing buffalo and a red stripe. What did you think? I think it's trash. I think it's an Ooh. ugly. I think it's an ugly helmet. I think it's an wow. ugly helmet that doesn't make sense. I they don't have black as a color. Well, I, I, okay. See, that's the thing. I think it doesn't look good with what he was wearing. Exactly, red on white, but the helmet itself is pretty sharp. Sure, but it's never. Okay. It doesn't match. Like it just doesn't make sense. I think there's a lot of things they could have done. I think of the ones he's done, like of these fake helmets, this is the worst one. That's just my opinion. You don't have to agree with it. I love the standing Buffalo logo. I just think, you know, first off, what I really think is let's just do it for real. 
what are we waiting for? Why isn't there a 90s throwback? Why aren't they wearing the retro jerseys? And I'm sure there's a legitimate answer for it. I have not actually heard it yet. So I think at one of these points, just actually debut a uniform, a new jersey, a new helmet, a new look. I, I think the Bills jerseys are pretty perfect. So I don't think that they need to change their primary jerseys, but I just think having another one in the rotation would definitely be a welcomed addition. Well, New COO Pete Gwelly was on WGR Sports Radio 550 with uh, Jeremy and Joe one morning at training camp. And he said, basically, hey, he has a lot of experience in this realm, which is uniforms, worked with the Charlotte Hornets doing it in conjunction with Michael Jordan. He worked with the New York Giants and really kind of everything leading up to their 100th year anniversary, which is going on now. And he said, you know, there's just a way you got to do it right. And he wants to do that now that he's here in Buffalo and in charge of the Bills, essentially. They're going to be looking at things like this. But, you know, I wouldn't expect anything imminent. You know, we'll see. In the meantime, you called the helmet trash. Well, I'm not going to go that far as far as the offense, but it didn't look very good early on, including Josh Allen getting picked several times by the defense. Kyrie Lim was in on an interception. Hold on. Go ahead. Hold on. I think this is a misconception, and I'm, I'm not just pointing this to you. He was intercepted once. The other one was an absolutely blatant defensive holding penalty that wiped out the mm-hmm. interception that was called. Like there was a flag on the field. It was situational. So they just ran it back. It would not have been an interception. The Kyrie Lam one was, but the first legit. one was not legit. So I've seen that misconception out there on social media from people who oh. were there, people covering it. So yeah. I just want to, I just want to be like, it wasn't as bad as it looks no. on a tweet or on a recap on a web story or something. Agreed. He was intercepted multiple times, but as I said, the offense didn't look very good. Yes. It wasn't Josh Allen who didn't look very good. He threw one pass that Kyrie Lim told me later. He read Josh and he had to high point the ball. Kyrie did a nice job. That was not a that was a ball Josh Allen should not have thrown. He also had one go literally off the chest of Curtis Samuel that should have been another interception. Yeah. Um, I, I agree with you. It wasn't all on Josh, but they go against his ledger, obviously. Of course. The offense as a whole, though, did not perform very well early on in practice. That's okay. The defense is allowed to win once in a while, right? Can we yeah. say that to people? Like, it's okay if the defense wins, even against an elite quarterback like Josh Allen. We've seen it happen now for one segment of practice about a week ago, and now one segment of practice here at, uh, at the return of the blue and red. I thought the defense was the better unit on Friday night and did a really good job. It wasn't all just Josh Allen throwing them footballs. There's no doubt about that. But the defense was the better of the two sides. Yeah, definitely. But what's interesting is I, you know, we got to think about headlines for the stories and how we're going to sum everything up. So the headline that I came up with, if you're somebody who knows anything about headlines, give me a little bit of pointers here. But it was like dominant day for defense as Buffalo Bills return home to Orchard Park. And I do think it was a dominant day. But I would still say as a whole, the offense has won more than the defense yeah, in this training camp. But I think that's really healthy because there are days where each side is winning. I think that's the sign of a good team. I think a couple of years ago, it felt like the offense was winning every single day. And then last year, it felt a little bit more like the defense was winning on a more regular basis than the offense. This year still would give a little bit of an edge to the offense, but it feels really balanced. And it's not like it's all happening there are days that are pretty even, but there's been days where the offense has been great, and there's been days when the defense is great, and I kind of think that's a good thing. I think that's what you want. Oh, I think it's absolutely a good thing you're preaching to the choir there. What I find interesting is usually this time of year you say the defense is ahead of the offense, and you throw in the fact that this defense has more returning players other than the secondary up front, front seven, than the offense. The offense is still working through chemistry with new wide receivers, a new center, right? You would think that maybe they'd be a little bit behind. I don't think that's been the case at all. There's been moments here or there, like we said. But overall, let's just talk about the offense, maybe even independently of going against their own defense You know, at training camp. Through a week plus, I'm encouraged by the way they've looked given all of the changes on that side of the ball. They feel It feels like it's not really – they're not growing – going, from to my eyes, through a lot of growing pains here. No, I would agree with that. I think that the growing pains are happening a bit at center. I feel like there have been some sloppy, I don't know if it's miscommunication or just, you know, poor execution, but there were a couple balls that hit the deck between Connor McGovern and Josh Allen earlier in training camp. I'm not overly concerned with that. It's one of those ones, put it on the back burner, see if that comes up in a game. But for right now, to be expected is they're trying to kind of figure things out. 
some issues with fumbles and some issues with drops, but I also think that that's to be expected with a bunch of guys that are learning how to play with Josh Allen, where he's placing the ball, what he likes to do, what he doesn't like to do. I also think it's quite simply a result of Josh Allen is able to extend plays longer than most of these guys has ever played, have ever played with like the Curtis Samuel interception today was on a play where Josh was getting pressured. He rolls out to the side. He extends the play. He finds a window. He throws it to Curtis Samuel. It hits Curtis Samuel right in the chest. I don't think Curtis Samuel was ready for it. I don't think he was anticipating that he was going to get the ball. All of a sudden, a ball is coming a million miles an hour at his chest. It pops up in the air, and then Taron Johnson gets the interception. So I have little concerns, but not any big picture or really, really big concern about the offense. I, I too, agree. I think they're farther along than I thought they would be. Other than Deion Dawkins leaving the field briefly the other day at camp and he returned right away, uh-huh. Matt, I think it's been the same starting five on every single first team rep that I've seen up front for the Buffalo Bills. This is a departure from years past where they've kind of rotated guys in just to rotate them in and say, hey, we got to have some position flex, even if it's not like a competition for a job. We've had that as well, but mm-hmm. it's been going left to right. Deion Dawkins, David Edwards, Connor McGovern, Osiris Torrance, Spencer Brown. That is it. We have not seen a rotation whatsoever through a week plus. No. And the only other observation that I really have about the offensive line is that Alec Anderson appears to be the new David Edwards, where last year they would bring in David Edwards to be their guy to, you know, just, Hey, he's eligible or Hey, he's there. That seems like it's going to be Alec Anderson. Now, Lyle Collins is another one to keep an eye on. He is, I believe, day-to-day with a knee injury, so we should see him back to practice soon. But I don't exactly know what to expect from him. Is he a guard? Is he a tackle? Early on in training camp, it feels more like he's probably an interior guy than an exterior guy. Ryan Vandermark and Alec Anderson are two depth guys that we have both said they are very, very high on. Mm -hmm. After that, it's going to kind of be a battle of all of the other players for probably one or two jobs. And we should also mention that Alec Anderson returned to the team the night that he was transported to a hospital via ambulance for heat related issues. And that was obviously great news. And we saw him actually, you know, at the return of the blue and red at Highmark stadium, which is really nice to see. I agree that, um, you know, Alec Anderson is going to play a role on this team in some capacity. Ryan Vandermark to me, swing tackle, at least, at least right tackle. And he went to actually left side. So he is the swing tackle to me. He's left side. He went to the left side when Dion did miss those few plays. So, it looks like they kind of have a, a what they view as you know their stable group up front on the offensive line. How about at wide receiver uh, through a week plus here? Anything that surprised you, whether positively or negatively? Well, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but I do think that's an important topic. So I did say, hey, any questions? And somebody asked if we could kind of yep. go through the wide receiver depth chart. So this feels okay. like the natural time to do it. I would say right now, if you were putting together a depth chart, who would you list as the Bills' number one wide receiver? Curtis Samuel. I think I agree. I think it would be Curtis Samuel slash Khalil Shakir in Ooh. either order. I think that those guys will be the guys. Well, how do you who, define number one as you're talking about it? Well, I guess that's the interesting thing because theoretically, it's the best receiver on the team and I don't know. I'm, I guess I'm basing this off of who I think is going to have the most targets, and that would be those two. So I don't know. Let's say, though, for me, those two are interchangeable. And then Keon Coleman. I think there's a very concise and clear top three. Then there's a gap. And then there's all the guys fighting for the roster. So right now, I would say the six wide receivers that make the team, I actually feel pretty confident about this, that it would be Khalil Shakir, Curtis Samuel, Keon Coleman, Mac Collins. Um, why am I blanking right now? Khalil you Shakir. Got MVS, for, you got MVS. Yeah, oh, MVS. Oh yeah, yeah, MVS, MVS. Okay. And Tyrell Shavers. Those would be the six that okay. I think make it. I think that there's a lot of people who are now skeptical about MVS a little bit, uh-huh. understandably so. Um, but I definitely think so far Shavers has leapfrogged Chase Claypool. Um, KJ Hamler, Justin Shorter, Brian Thompson, all those other guys. Okay, so but you said there was a clear top three, then a gap, then fighting for spots. But Mac Hollins to me is is not fighting for a spot. He's in a top four then. De- I think, but I I think there's a t- clear top three talent wise. Like Mac right. Hollins to me is definitely making the team, but I'm not saying that he's 
in the category of those other three. Matt Collins is definitely making the team because, yes, he can play receiver, and I think he could contribute, but also because of special teams and also because of just the leadership that he brings. Like, there's a lot of boxes that he checks. So he's definitely well, making the team. I just don't think he's in that top three. I agree. Um, I don't think that Shakir, I would consider him in the number one, but I get where you're coming from. I get it. Like to me, the number one is a guy that they're going to, he's going to be on the field more. They rely on more. It's like Shakir, like he plays in the slot mostly. Right. I mean, that's what mm -hmm. we're expecting. And that's where you're going to have Dalton Kincaid or James Cook line up. And yeah, you can do more things. It just feels like opportunity won't be there as much as for the other guys. But I agree with you. It's all kind of parsing a different way with the top three that you're talking about. How much does Claypool's toe injury hurt him? Because, you know, we haven't seen him because of the toe injury. And even before the toe injury, it wasn't like he was lighting up practice. And not that he did anything bad necessarily, but mm -hmm. it wasn't standing out necessarily. Now, MBS isn't standing out necessarily. Tyrell Shavers is standing out. And I'll tell you the other guy that's starting to stand out a little bit to me for a different reason. KJ Hamler, because I think he's in the mix to have a return job. So I think you have to consider him here. Yeah, I know, but... The opportunities offensively have not led to a lot of success for KJ Hamler. And I don't think he has run away with a job as a returner. So that's why, to me, I still think it's the outside looking in. And I do think that Tyrell Shavers has earned, at least for now, a, a real opportunity to make the roster. I, I would have a hard yeah, time keeping KJ Hamler because of what he might be able to do in special teams more so than a six foot four wide receiver who has just continued to make plays for this team. I mean, like let's base it off of just who has Josh Allen been working with. He's been working with all yeah. the regulars you'd expect and Tyrell Shavers. So to me, that kind of shows their hand of like, Hey, they're, they're not doing that just because. They're doing that because they think at some point this season, Josh Allen might be throwing the ball at the Tyrell Shavers. I agree. And I do wonder what, you know, of all this, what it, the conjunction with Claypool's toe though, right? And Shavers uh -huh. even getting more opportunity and where would Claypool fall in here? But I agree that Claypool's kind of fallen off. So I was MVS a little bit. I did see Justin Shorter get a little run with the ones the other day. So what is your MVS take? What is your MVS take? Because it's really interesting because I think eight days into training camp, he has not been nearly as involved as I anticipated. Agreed. However, he's also the longest tenured vet in the league um, of the on group the yeah, on yeah. the team in that group. So I don't, I mean, right. Is that right? He's, he's got more years than anybody in that room, right? I, I mean, he, he has does. to, right. well, yeah. ooh, Curtis Samuel has been around. A while. I know that's why I'm thinking. I mean, we'll, we'll see, but so my, my, I, the way I look at it is, they're kind of giving them time here as a veteran and they don't need to necessarily press them into duty. But at some point you got to see that you got to see it happen in a preseason game. Mm -hmm. I think they're going to let that happen with Chase Claypool. It's like, okay, we don't just want to dismiss them and get rid of them. Now we got to see him perform in a preseason game. We got to be fair to him. So we'll hopefully see when, you know, his toe injury uh, comes back. What, how, at this point, how many tight ends do you think they would keep? And what are the names? Okay, I'm glad you asked this because there was actually a little bit of a disagreement on the sideline about this. I think they keep three, and okay. I would say right now they're keeping Dalton Kincaid, Dawson Knox, and Zach Davidson mm -hmm. as opposed to Quentin Morris. Now, I was talking to Catherine Fitzgerald from the Buffalo News, Elena Gatzenberg from ESPN, and myself, and Dom Tibbetts, my colleague, and we were talking about that whole Quentin Morris, Zach Davidson thing. And they said, well, Quentin Morris plays special teams – and they'll definitely favor that because Zach Davidson does not contribute on special teams, which I understand. But Zach Davidson had two catches at the scrimmage tonight. He had a bunch of catches this week. It feels like he is a player that all spring has just continued to climb. And my biggest argument for Zach Davidson is that the team kept him around. Like they've had him around. So for me, why keep him around if then he's ultimately going to make plays? And then you decide you don't want to keep him. So, you know, Perino even said it when we were talking too. He was like, yeah, but you can get Zach Davidson to your practice squad. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't care. I don't want to risk losing the guy. You can get Quentin Morris to your practice squad. So I think Davidson right now is more, I, I would give him the edge. You can get Quentin Morris to your practice squad. I'm going to give you the argument for Quentin Morris here though, which is, Everything everybody said is correct, but 
yes, to me, it's easier to just say Zach Davidson's here. He's been here two years. Like what team is really going to go pluck him? Quentin Morris, because some team might want a guy who plays special teams might actually go do that. <laughs> you know, that's why you would lean that way. But certainly to me, Zach Davidson has been the better standout offensive player in camp in camp than Quentin Morris, for sure. I just, I do lean towards Quentin just because of a lot of things that you've heard here, but I am certainly open to the idea of Zach Davidson. Let me ask you this and finish up this part. Could they keep four? They're going to want to play a lot of 12 personnel. If they keep four, how do you keep four and also keep Reggie Gilliam? Which they that, are doing. Reggie Gilliam on do- this team. Which they're doing. So to me, it's like, do you keep four, you keep Reggie Gilliam, you keep six receivers, but then you keep one less defensive lineman. But I don't see that happening, right? I just think that because of the players that they have over there, they're keeping at minimum four defensive tackles and at minimum five or six edge rushers. So it's like, I don't know, you you can't fit everybody on the roster. So I think three is the, the max that they would go at tight ends. I really do. Well, some of this, you have to consider injuries, obviously. And a couple sure. injuries occurred on Friday night. Um, you tweeted out, you saw a couple linebackers leave. And yeah. now you're starting to get even more depletion on the defensive side. You already have Mike Edwards out and Cole Bishop out, which mm-hmm. changes the dynamic of the safety room, of course. And now a couple of linebackers left practice early. Yeah, so Nicholas Morrow left practice with, let's say, 25, 30 minutes left. I did not see why he left practice. Now, I know he was a little bit banged up earlier in the week. I don't know if it was a re-aggravation. I don't know if it was something different, but he was leaving practice very gingerly, walked out on his own with a couple trainers. Then 10 minutes after that, Eddie Olafoscio, Olafoscio, I'm just Eddie, was making a tackle on a drill. It was first and goal from the two, and whoever the running back was, it might have been Frank Gore Jr., ran into him. He brought him down to the ground. And then all of the players started to do the wave to the trainers. Like, no, he's like actually injured. He was grabbing his wrist and he immediately Mm. went up the tunnel and into the locker room. So to me, that looks like a wrist injury just because he was holding it. That's where they were looking. I don't know on Moro, but when you consider that Milano was not doing team drills, Moro leaves practice Eddie gets injured. Those are three linebackers, and there's probably, you know, I think Eddie Olafoscio and Nicholas Morrow probably had pretty good chances of making this team. So now I don't know what you do. I don't know if you go and sign somebody if the injuries are significant. I don't know if you just let's, really hope for the best. You know, they, they got a lot of things they got to figure well, out. Well, let's at least go over the depth chart. Dorian Williams and Bale Inspector are ahead of those guys anyway. I mean, these guys are your, your five and six. You think Bale Inspector is ahead of somebody they drafted literally this year? Yes. Really? Interesting. Because yes. I don't know if I would feel that way. Bale Inspector started for them in that Pittsburgh Steelers game, even ahead of Dorian Williams. I think that they like Bale Inspector. Um, yeah, I do. I, I put him ahead of him. Yeah. I, now, I tell you, I think Eddie Eddie's a good athlete and he can he can yeah. run and I mean I'd put him ahead of Nicholas Morrow. I think Morrow's a guy that he's been around. He's had hundred tackles in this league, but to me, that's just a depth piece that you brought in and kind of stabilized it a little bit. I think, yeah, your two middle, your two backups are Bale Inspector. And from what I've seen, they've been the two backups this year at yeah, camp. yeah. I think that Dorian Williams is definitely their number three. When Matt Milano isn't on the field, Dorian yes. Williams is the one who's getting those reps. Bale Inspector, I would say, would be more of a the next kind of mm-hmm. notch down to those other three, but. I but he's the backup to Terrell Bernard. Sure, sure, exactly. I think it's a place that they can improve on regardless right, of right, the injury right. situation. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what they do. I mean, do they go out and they sign a veteran if the injury to Olafoscio is long, if it's something significant, if Moro's injury is not anything that they think is going to you know play into the season? Is he just that guy? A lot of it will depend on how many people they keep, but I think that is a position where you probably lean towards – you know, the high end of keeping players just because of the injury that Matt Milano was coming off of. And, you know, I just think that's a position that you don't really want to risk having the injury bug bite you because last year they did. And then AJ Klein came out of retirement to be covering Travis Kelsey in a playoff game and was one of the main reasons why they lost the game. Not AJ Klein, just the injuries to linebacker. Sure. No doubt about it. 
All right. In the secondary at safety, a lot of injuries as well. Cole Bishop yeah, now week to week. Uh, Mike Edwards still week to week. You have guys banged up in the secondary, especially at safety. That's open to the door for DeMar Hamlin, who's had a strong spring and here into training camp. But for him to even get more reps as a starter next to Taylor Rapp behind him, I've seen Kendall Williamson probably more than anyone. Uh, Cam Lewis can play safety. He's been back there a little bit. They did sign Kareem Jackson, who's a 36 mm-hmm. year old veteran, and Terrell Burgess, who's a 25 year old, four year veteran, actually a former third round pick. Uh, do you think these guys factor in the equation at all? Do you think that they are? They have a chance to make the team, or is this just, hey, we need bodies here to get through camp until these guys come back? Can I cut to the chase? Can I just go right yeah. there and skip over this? When is Micah yeah. Hyde coming back? When is Micah <laughs> Hyde coming back? Like, to me... I don't think it's anytime soon. As to me, I would imagine... I, I, I don't know the answer to this. You've got as good of a relationship with Micah Hyde as anybody on the beat. I, I don't know if it's just happening. It's just a matter of when, not if. Or if he is still legitimately debating if he wants to play football. Because to me, if I was Brandon Bean this week, I would have got on the phone with Micah and said, Hey, Micah, we've got a week left of training camp. I know you're not coming to live in a dorm at St. John Fish University, and I'm not anticipating that you're going to play in any preseason games. But get here by mid-August, and you're going to be the starting safety alongside Taylor Rapp, really regardless of what even happens with the injuries. And I don't know if that conversation has happened yet, but if that was me, and it was my team with the cap space that they have, it would already be basically an agreement made where they just don't put pen to paper until it's official. Okay, I think the part that you're missing is that last piece that you said with the cap space they have. Matt, what do you think Micah Hyde's going to play for? He's not playing for the minimum salary. He's not. No, no, but, like, why wouldn't he come play for, like, $2 million? Like, that's that's what Jordan Poyer's Poyer's getting to, like, actually practice in a training camp. I think Jordan Poyer is going to want to play this game until somebody kicks him off the field and literally drags him. I don't think that's the case with Micah Hyde. With Micah Hyde, I believe, because of my relationship with him and just kind of knowing him and his family, mm-hmm. I think Micah Hyde would say it's got to be a little bit more worth it. Like, I just can't, I'm not going to do it for that. Like, I love it. I want to play if he wants to play, but it's not like, oh my God, it doesn't matter. I'll play this game for free. That is not Micah Hyde. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you think? In the what situation. Do you think, what do you think the right number is? What do you think would be for worth him? $3 million? You might probably look be looking at something like that. And I don't know if the Bills want to do anything like that at, at this stage because, you know, of the injury history and the cap space they have. There's a lot of factors here. Um, let's also remember from the Bills side, if you are any vested veteran who's on the club after week one, mm-hmm. their salary is guaranteed. Yeah. If you're the Bills, you don't want to bring in a veteran to have him on the field week one and then guarantee his salary. That's something you do after week one to say, look, then we can get out of it if we need to, and we'll figure it out. The other part is if Mike, like you said, you said this, right. If he comes in, he's the starting safety. You're not signing Micah Hyde to sit the bench and the Bills signed. What did, what did Sean McDermott say? They signed Mike Edwards to be a starting safety. Mm -hmm. Now you, we can all say, oh, we want, no, Micah Hyde's better. I don't know if they believe that at this point from what they've seen the last couple of years. If Micah Hyde is signed, he's got to play. He's not sitting on the bench. And you're going to sign him to a number where you're going to want to play him anyway. That's why I think this is a much more complicated issue than just saying, oh, my God, we're depleted at safety. Go get the guy. I mean, I think that it's the break glass in case of emergency situation. But so far, they have been in a position where they might need to break glass in case of emergency. I think that Mike Edwards is the plan. But Mike Edwards was the plan to get those reps in the spring. And then he got hurt. Mm -hmm. And then he was the then he was the plan to get those reps in the summer and he got hurt again. Like what if something happens right now to what if something happens to Taylor rap, right? Because Mm -hmm. he's the guy that we're all penciling in. But what if something happens to him? Are you really comfortable with Kareem Jackson and DeMar Hamlin back there at your safeties? Not at all. So I know that they're both week to week right now, but I don't know if I love the idea of one of those guys, not Taylor Rapp, but either Cole Bishop or Mike Edwards playing and starting for the Bills without any snaps in the preseason. Edwards obviously like has played in Super Bowls, so he doesn't, it's not like he needs it from a talent level or anything like that, but he definitely needs it from just a communication standpoint and from a getting on the same page as everybody else on the defense standpoint. That's an important position for the Bills. 
it's really interesting how, about this, but week to week can, can meet is literally week to week. I mean, they could be back on the practice field next week. If the bills feel that they'll be ready before week one, I just don't think they're going to make any other like significant moves at the top. We talked about this Monday night at bar bill mm-hmm. and it happened. I said, I think I, I could see them adding at the bottom. I don't see them adding at the top right now to the safety and safety room. And that's Micah Hyde. You add, he goes right to the top of your safety depth chart. Cause he's got a play. You're not adding him not to do that. I want to ask you about the other uh, move they made. They, released Jack Browning. And I thought that Jack Browning was going to really legitimately uh, challenge Sam Martin for the punting job. That's obviously not going to happen. A lot of people in the media and fans have declared, okay, the punting job, the competition's over. Well, let me stop you. It's halfway over sort of this phase of it is over. You, I could see a scenario where the bills see a punter on the waiver wire. They like better than Sam Martin. Yes. He's won the job from Jack Browning. It doesn't mean he's won the job on the Mm -hmm. roster yet. You know who you're not considering right now? College punter Zach Davidson, who also punted when he was. Oh, in wow. I like so, that. You know what? There More you incentive that you don't even need to. Maybe you can keep four tight ends if you don't keep a punter. And yeah. Zach Davidson can be your punter. I think that Sam Martin is just going to be the punter. I don't think there would be anybody out there who they would like more than him. I don't think he's. Well, you never know. He, it's he's, a waiver to, wear. he's totally fine. I don't think he's great. I don't think he's bad. I think he's totally fine. That is exactly how I feel about Sam Martin. I think that. He is serviceable for what you need from a punter. You would like more, but whatever. That's kind of my feeling. All right. Want to answer some questions? What do you want to do? Yeah. Here? Well, one of, them is, else? one of them is directly correlated to Sam Martin. Are we, okay. where's our concern level with Tyler Bass? Cause this is something well, we talked, this is something we talked about on our last episode, but there was a question specifically about Tyler Bass. And I think it's because he tried to kick today a 58 yarder and basically kicked the ball to Lackawanna. Okay, so means it was no good, right? Not that <laughs> it means he kicked it. It was no good. 75 no yards good. good. Yeah. yeah. Um there's two parts of this. Like when you say concern level, there's a concern level for the fan or are you asking like is there is he in danger of anything? He's not in danger of losing his job. There he is a young he is a they're young. He's a guy that they drafted, they signed an extension to, there's financial considerations. He's kicked in big spots and big moments and big games. Yes, mm-hmm. he had a down year last year. Also, Matt, I think he's had a pretty good start to camp so far, even though he missed one today. He's been, I think I counted overall, I think he's he's missed two kicks in like 11 or 12 that they've done that I've seen in you know, camp over at St. John Fisher. So... I don't know, a 58 yarder, right? I mean, it's a 50. Oh yeah. He made everything. Easy. He made everything else too today. Right. So I mean he like, everything okay. Else. Yeah. I, I just don't think a, he's not in danger of losing his job, but sure. I think you should be concerned until you see him actually do it in a game again. If you're a fan for sure. All right. This question is from Eric. He said, who do you think the third defensive tackle is going to be? Is it Dwayne Carter? Um, if so, do you have any concerns about him and Ed being out there at the same time, given they're both smaller size? You know, it seems like Ed is better when he's got a bigger guy like Daquan Jones, Jordan Phillips next to him. Um, I'll let you answer this. I'll, I'll let you answer this, but I'll tell you something crazy about Dwayne Carter. I don't know if you saw this clip or not, but after practice today, I was trying to talk to some of the rookies because for some of the rookies, it would have been their first yep. time out there. Did you know that today was Dwayne Carter's first ever time ever inside the stadium in like ever when he got drafted by the bills, he got in late and had to catch a flight after his mm. interview. So he never I got a chance. That. He never got a chance to go into the stadium. And then That's because amazing. when he got back, they immediately went to Rochester. He has never been out on the stadium or in the building. So he was like, when I walked out the tunnel today, it was my first time ever with my eyes seeing the stadium, which is crazy to me. That's pretty interesting, right? Yeah, I, I, I do share the concern of the person who asked the question, which is two undersized DTs in the middle. I don't know if you pair them together or not. Is he the third DT? No. I mean, I think he's the fourth, right? The third is going to be Austin Johnson. Austin Johnson. Yeah, I think probably Austin Johnson. Mm-hmm. And... Actually, he may be number five if you count count Dwayne Smoot because Dwayne I was going to say right, yes. Right now, Dwayne yes. Smoot is playing everything on the D line. He's out there a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I would think right now your top three are Ed Oliver, Daquan Jones are clearly your top two. Austin Johnson, I would say, is pretty clearly your number three, and then four will be some sort of rotation of Dwayne Carter, but also Smoot, and then that's why. I think Smoot is basically a roster lock at this point because yeah. I do think that first off, Dwayne Carter was a third round pick. He's definitely making the team. 
Javon Solomon was a fifth round pick. He's definitely making the team. So if you want to look at it as defensive line as a whole, it's going to be Greg Rousseau, Von Miller, AJ Epinesa, Dwayne Smoot, Javon Solomon. That's five names. Then let's add four for defensive tackle. Then that's Ed Oliver, Daquan Jones, it's Austin Johnson, and it's um, Dwayne Carter. That's nine guys, defensive line. Maybe you save one more. Maybe. But you don't have to because Smoot gives you position flexibility. Mm -hmm. And Greg Rousseau does a little bit, too. Mm -hmm. And so does Austin Johnson, actually. So they've got some guys who can play inside and outside. So it's interesting to me, like you say, like Javon Car- Javon Solomon, because of you know he has to make the team as a fifth round pick. I agree, it's more likely than not, but I don't know. I just don't know how they keep all these guys. To be quite honest, and I don't know. If sometimes they- you just you, sometimes you just have to make those decisions. I agree with you that to me, usually a fifth round pick is going to make it. It's kind of rare that you don't, but it's not unprecedented if they say like, "Look, we just have enough guys and." We're gonna have to get him in the practice squad if we can. It might it might be unprecedented with unprecedented with this group, though. I can't remember them ever in year one moving on from a fifth round pick. First off, and that's not even to say like Javon Solomon has not been bad or anything. We're just saying for the sake of the conversation. I don't know. The only one I could think of was they traded uh, Wyatt Teller a year, you know. I'm gonna look at it right now. Well, Marquez right. Stevenson was a fifth round pick. But I yeah, think but they, he, he made the, he made the team as an IR guy. Uh-huh, that's what I mean. Justin Shorter was an IR guy, right? We have uh-huh. that. Uh, Tommy Doyle made the team, I believe, yeah. out of camp, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Jake Fromm was the the COVID QB. Mm-hmm. So oh, they've never uh, did Voshan Joseph. He might have gone on IR. He never played. Yeah, I, yeah, I was gonna say I don't think he ever played. But, but the point Joseph is, we're, we're, we're blast yeah, but we are we are digging deep here for it, and you're right. Like, yeah. Normally, your your fifth round pick is going to make the team, and then in this case, too, a, a pass rusher, a spot where they really like. So Von Miller, Greg Rousseau, AJ Epinesa, Juan Smoot, and now Javon Solomon becomes your five. Then you know you got, and that's fine. Kingsley Jonathan, Casey Tuhill, these are the guys on the outside looking in. If you do that, mm-hmm, for sure. All right, let's uh, let's go to this one. And then we can probably wrap up. Is Von Miller really looking a lot better? What do you think? Yes, I'll I'll put Von Miller and Matt uh, Milano in the same vein here and say that I think for different reasons they're looking better and more progress and progressing more. Now Von just looks like he's got his. He just looks like he's kind of you know fitting in and not, there's nothing you wouldn't know that he's coming off a of injury even two mm-hmm. years ago. The age, yes. I'm not saying that he's looking like, oh my God, Von Miller. He's wrecking up every single play on offense. Mm-hmm. But I think Von Miller has done some nice things, and I like the way he looks. For Matt Milano, I agree with when coaches say he's getting better every day. I think he's getting better every day, Matt. I yeah. think he's feeling looking more comfortable with his leg every day, which is a really big sign. What do you think the split between Von Miller and AJ Epinesa ends up being? Because Von Miller, after we did our live podcast at Bar Bill, stacked together some nice days. I think his best day that he had was the day after the show, which was on Tuesday. They were off Wednesday. They practiced Thursday. They practiced Friday. Every day he's kind of gotten, you know, continuing to go in that right direction. Now, to be fair, the day that he was really good, the Tuesday was third and long day. So he yep. could just get after it. So situationally, and he also didn't he didn't play the day before. He was fresh. Exactly. So situationally, it just made sense that he was going to have a good day. Um but that being said, do you think that this is a they use Von Miller on first down and third down and AJ is in all of the obvious, you know, rushing situations? Or do you think that he will still get the the lion's share of the snaps and AJ will be the third man up? No, I think mm, I think AJ might out snap him, actually. Yeah. I think AJ I, I think more I of a first and second down guy. Yeah. Um, not all of them, but I think more of first and second down. Von will be more of the third down guy. Mm-hmm. But I think AJ still plays some on third down. So that's yeah. why that happens. And um, I think Greg Rousseau, same way. Greg Rousseau is a really good run defender. He's yeah, your first he and second down defensive end. But I think you want him on the field on a lot of third downs too, because I think he can rush the passer pretty well. He can mm-hmm. get his hands up on the interior, obviously. So, you know, I, I think the thing about the DN group has always been for me, the floor is high. Like they have a good floor. Where's the ceiling though? You got to find that ceiling. Somebody who has that ceiling. Yeah, that's the guy he's playing up here because the floor is pretty good with this group. I think. 
Yeah, for sure. All right, let's do one more question just because I thought he had a really nice day on Friday at the Blue and Red scrimmage. Uh, I've heard some good things about Ray Davis, but also keep hearing he's got trouble with ball security. Has this been a repeat issue for him at training camp? Do you want me to take it or you want to take it? You go ahead. Yeah, it has been an issue for him at training camp. He's let a couple balls hit the deck. However, Friday was a really good day for him. He broke off a run that would have probably been a 60 or 70 yard run. He got taken And then he out. fumbled at the end. Um, I don't yeah, think he fumbled he... at the end. It was punched out. I think they blew the whistle because the going... they were do they were doing the whole thud up thing, so they didn't want you to get to... like he literally got thrown to the Hold ground on. from right to left. They were moving early on, and he had a long run. Correct, right to left. They were going towards the non tunnel side. Right, and he so was. If this is the play that I'm talking about, you are. He clearly had it punched out at the end. Yes, it was at the end of the play, but the oh, DB chasing him literally punched it out, the peanut punch, and it came out. Oh, I did not see that. Yes. I, I literally, I saw a whole, like, scuffle at the end because he, oh, wait, this might be it. Okay, literally, I found that? a video. I found a video. Okay. Uh, thank you to Trey White for Vesna. So, okay, yes, <laughs> it was name. Trey White for Vesna. Yes, he is running. And yes, you are correct that Christian Benford did punch yes. it out at the end. Wow. I am literally learning this on the podcast because for my, you can see me in this video. Holy crap. You oh. can see me in this video and I see him go to the ground and the whistle get blown, but the ball definitely comes out. Yeah. Okay. Well, so that, that's been that, an issue. That has been an issue then adds even more fuel to the fire, which is interesting I because I would have I, said, I, I, that, wait, hold on. I, Wait, I got to mute that. I had it on my computer so I could watch it. Now I'm going to watch it here too. Yeah. Uh, Trey White for Vesna. Um, thank you for having this video out because I did not see this angle from where I was. The ball was at the 30. He has this. He runs oh, it yeah. to Cliff about him. the 15. And yes, this would have been a fumble. And Can I tell you what bothers me about this run? This is such a thing that it's a thing, but it's me. It's a coaching point. Put the ball in your outside arm. Why is he uh, carrying the ball in his left arm? He, he is when carrying he is... it inside his left arm. Yes. I yes. Put it in your outside arm. Yes. Like you uh, should not. You, that's now. I'm not telling you that you can't punch it out the other way, but it's way harder for mm -hmm. Benford to get to that arm than it is to get to the inside arm. Well, that's just angles. It's just like it's, right. You can't go through somebody to get to their right. arm if you can't touch. You got it. That's the, a coaching point. I guarantee you. Guarantee you. That's the first thing that Kelly Skipper told. Him. Besides, hold on to the damn ball. He said, yeah. put it in your outside arm. Do you think though, because I did, I not knowing that this ball hit the deck, I said that I think he does have the inside track to be the backup running back because Ty Johnson has been unavailable so far. Yes. And I thought that they were very close. Would you agree with that? Or would you think that because they have not had any of these issues with Ty Johnson, he would just immediately step back in and be their quote number two running back? They I think Ray Davis Ray, kind of a lot yeah, with their first. They, I stuff. think Ray Davis, given his draft status, and how they've been using him, I still think he's the front runner for that job. Yes. Okay, I agree. But yes, there have been concerns because I didn't even know about the concern from tonight, yeah. and there had been other instances, at least two of them that I can think of, where the ball has been fumbled, and that's not good. So that definitely is something that needs to be cleaned up. That is a tad concerning. Anything else? Anything you want to get to? Um, I don't think so. Other than. 1130 Hold on. on a Friday night. No, no, no. So Hall of Fame game real quick. Did you watch any of it? Did you I see did. the kickoffs? I did. I What'd did. you think? Uh, still, I still don't understand why you don't just kick it out of the back of the end zone and just give it to a team at the 30 yard line. I feel like teams are going to get good at this and they're going to figure out blocking formations and they're going to hit the hole and somebody's going to break off a big run. I will say it did exactly what it was supposed to do. I did not look away. Now I know it's something new, but I was engaged. The minute the broadcast came back on, I'm staring at it like, Ooh, I want to see what happens. But if I was a special teams coordinator, I would just be like, all right, Tyler, kick it through the back of the end zone. Every single time we will give them the ball at the 30. We are not risking giving up a big the other thing too is like if you get past the last line of the defense then it's up to your kicker yeah tyler well, bassett that's the way it is now anyway sh sure before that i should say 
Well, yeah, sure. But I'm like even more so because those guys are so much further ahead of where the kicker is. It'll mm-hmm. literally be the open field. It'll be the yep. kicker and nobody else around. And the kickers are just going to get demolished. It's going to be really interesting. And if you're going to the game next Saturday, the Bills against mm-hmm. the Bears, first preseason game, you're going to see kickoffs because I'm telling you right now, they're not going to be kicking it through the end zone in preseason. They need to do no, roster. No, they want to try. They want to try. That's right. They want to see what they can do. They're going to do roster evaluation. They're also not going to do anything super creative on the kickoffs of preseason. They don't want to show their hands. That's exactly. right. It's going to be very um, Does Caleb Williams play next week, you think? He has. I think to, he does. Right? I think he does. Um, he didn't play. On Thursday in night in the Hall of Fame game, I think he plays next week, but you never know. They might wait a couple weeks even to put him in. He is the starter for them. Yeah, um, for you, because you can see me and anybody who's watching this on YouTube. I have a white undershirt on right here and a black yep. polo. I have my black Channel 7 polo. What does this outfit make you think of? Because somebody at training camp said, oh, you look like a, a look like a, what do I look like? I mean, a priest? No. Yeah, they said I look like a priest because of the white collar and the black shirt. So I was like, wow, look at that. Wow. Yeah. So you, I you, a, did you bless practice? <laughs> I, I did not. But fun fact, I have officiated a wedding. I'm Catholic, so I know that's very okay. different. Than, I, I know, you know, officiating a wedding, it's not quite the uh, same criteria as did a priest. You, you but, were the, did you, you read the vows? Is that what you mean by that? Officiate? No, like I like legally married two people. Yeah. Yeah, right. I, I, they did their own vows. I didn't have to do that, but you know, brothers and sisters were gathered here today. That whole thing. My best friend from high school and growing up, so I've known him for, I'm 51. I've known him for 45 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, he officiated, he married us in our wedding. Oh, beautiful. And that's because in Florida, you just have to be a notary to do it. Oh, no kidding. Really? That is not what has to happen here. Unless you have like a, I guess, unless you have a, I'm not a really religious person. So I'm guessing if I had had a, if we had had a really Catholic wedding, it might've been different. I'm not sure. Whereas yeah. yours probably was. So I don't really know the logistics of that. All I know is uh-huh. legally just being a notary allowed him to do it. Yeah. I Well, if you tell you know, me any we, different then I haven't actually been married for 21 years and you're going to blow my mind. Yeah, so it's okay. Exactly. Well, like in New York state, I had to like fill out something online and say that I'm, you know, basically an ordained minister, yes. but from, you know, I'm Catholic. My wife's Catholic. We got married in a Catholic church. There are a lot of things you have to do to get married in a Catholic church, including pre Cana, which was like an eight hour process of a Saturday before the wedding itself actually happened. So yeah, it's a, it's a little different than just the, uh, showing up. Are you going to be at practice Sunday and Monday this week? I will be there Monday. I'm not going Sunday. And then that means that there will only be, there's only four practices left. So they practice Sunday okay. with fans, Monday, no fans close but to the media. public off day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, their last two days off Friday practice or uh preseason game number one next Saturday. So I'll be there okay. Monday, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday is my plan. All right. Well, Matt has a great team over at WKBW TV channel seven covering uh, practice, so you can follow along with them as well. Paul Hamilton's going to be covering Sunday for me. I have a baseball tournament to coach actually this weekend, so I won't be there Sunday. I'll be back at practice on Monday. So the next time we, you and I get together, will be Monday after practice, Monday. I guess. Maybe we can do something like this again. Let's do it. All right. Thanks a lot for tuning in to It's Always Game Day in Buffalo. Please don't forget, you can subscribe to us wherever you pod. Any of the audio places where you do that, that's where we are. And of course, video Sal Sports on YouTube. Thanks again.